once more tonight on this closing service, I'd like to say how very deeply I have appreciated the gracious, loving welcome afforded to me by this church, its pastor, Mr. Alan Burroughs, officers and members, to thank them for making it so easy for me to be here and speak night by night, <laughs> and in thanking them to thank also the co-sponsors of these meetings the campaigners for Christ and for all that Mr. Gordon Rymers and Mr. Bruce Bryson and others associated have done in organizing these meetings as they have. It's been certainly a very heartwarming week for me and I've enjoyed enormously the fellowship with God's people here in Adam. I feel it's been a profitable week too as the Lord Jesus has graciously <coughs> presenced himself in our midst, as he always will and always does and always must, according to his wonderful promises, and by his Holy Spirit has led us through the word into wonderful discoveries. <coughs> the greatest of all, of course, being that from beginning to end, start to finish, all that we have is the spiritual content of our faith, is vested in himself. He's the author and the finisher and everything that comes in between. And the lovely thing to know is that once we have put our trust in Christ as Savior, God can't give us more than we have for he's given us Christ and we don't need to have less. How wonderfully wealthy we become when we are truly born of God, of his Holy Spirit. Numbered as Paul puts it in the epistle to the Philippians and in the third chapter amongst those who by a spiritual and moral resurrection <laughs> have been lifted out from among the dead even while in the body. That's what happens when you know Christ as your Savior that if possible, he says, Philippians 3.11, by my knowledge of him, may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. Not one day when I get to heaven, no, no, in the present tense, right now, with my two feet on the earth, lifted from among the dead, because unconverted people, those who have never received the Lord Jesus as their Redeemer, those who have never experienced the miracle of new birth, regeneration, the restoration of the Holy Spirit to the human spirit of a forgiven sinner, are dead, lightly, uninhabited, without God, subhuman, as we have discovered this week. But when you come to Christ and you're cleansed in the precious blood that was shed on that first Easter so many years ago, and you've been reconciled to God and peace between you and him has been re-established and he sealed this wonderful transaction by the restoration to you of that which makes man man, God's presence within him by the Holy Spirit. You lift it out from among the dead. You're born of God. You're regenerate, raised, alive again. It's both the spiritual and the moral resurrection. Because the spiritual resurrection whereby God the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you is the one who now implements in you that moral resurrection that enables him in and through you to implement the righteousness of the law. And so we see what the law could not do through the weakness of the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That was Easter. 1900 years ago, the place not only where he died, but the place where he rose again from the dead, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk now, not after the flesh, our old, original, fallen state of bankrupt, but after the spirit, our illimitable, inexhaustible supplies of wealth, vested in us in the person of the spirit of the risen Lord, who credits us with Christ, for every step of the way. Now that's salvation. 
And because of that, Paul goes on to say in the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, I know how to be abased and live humbly in straitened circumstances, and I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and a spare, or going without and being in want. Listen to this lovely verse, Philippians 4.13. I have strength, not I hope to have, not I beg for strength, not I plead for, not I, uh, no, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and I'm equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. The original word from which that expression is taken in our English Bible is the same word from which the English word autonomous comes from. What he's saying is this. <clears throat> in Jesus Christ, I am autonomous, self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Everything that Christ is in me makes me self-supporting. I don't need a crutch anymore. <clears throat> I'm not carried along by others. I'm autonomous because Christ fills me with all the fullness of the Godhead body. He fills me and he floods me with God himself. <clears throat> you can't have more than that. And you don't need to have less. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not you struggling to be like Christ, but Christ just being himself as you place yourself at his disposal. Present your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. These are some of the wonderful discoveries that we've been making. Some rediscovering. Blessings of the past have been quickened. Memories have been awakened. And the light has come back into the eye. Some making the discovery for the first time. Never realizing, never having dreamed before how much was involved in being converted, restored to God. Little realizing that it was heaven on the way to heaven, not just heaven one day when you get there. And some may be having found Christ as Savior for the first time. Well, it's been a good week, and we thank God for it. And I've loved being amongst you. A little bit homesick. First time I've been away at Easter. There are about 200 noisy brats in my home right now, at this very month. <laughs> and I'd love to be there. We shall have about 650 of them this month. And it's the first time ever that I've been away at this time of the year. But they're in good hands. <clears throat> and I rejoice to have the privilege of being away from them in order to be with you. Now, my final word to you tonight, I feel should be especially directed to any there may be amongst us who at the close of this week still are uncertain as to whether they have ever received Christ as their Savior. You, you see, you may be well instructed in many things concerning the Christian faith. Know the facts and still be denied the life. Know the language, but without the experience of an indwelling faith. And the fact that you may know the fact, the very fact that you have been tutored, that you have been Christianized, that you know the language, that you may even have given mental consent to the basic tenets of the faith, may in itself deceive you as to the true situation of your own soul. I remember being at a boys' camp in England, about a hundred boys. There was a family assisting with the chores, doing the cooking and various things like that. They were combining business with pleasure. And they brought their family too. And they had a small boy about 12 years of age amongst several others. And he had heaps of fun in the local farmyard. He used to go and assist the farmer. At least that's what he professed to be doing. He probably got more in the way than he assisted. But on one occasion he went out to assist to cut a hedge. And in the process, a briar was drawn across his face and a thorn pierced one of his eyes. He didn't take undue notice of it, nor indeed did his parents. It was a bit sore, it rubbed it a bit. 
But about two days later, it became highly inflamed and very painful. And he was brought to the camp doctor, a Mr. Virgin, who in the providence of God was an eye specialist and surgeon. He'd been principal of the medical college in Dachau in India. And he examined the eye of the boy. And the strange thing was this. When he examined the boy's eye, he discovered, even to the boy's surprise, that in the eye that had been damaged, he was blind. He was blind and didn't know. By a strange coincidence, being the damaged eye, you see, and the one that hurt, he'd always either had the bad eye shut and the good eye open, or both the bad eye and the good eye shut, but he had never had the good eye shut and the bad eye open. <laughs> because that's the one that hurt. <laughs> and so, without knowing it, he was blind. Because he could see through one eye, he didn't know he was blind in the other eye. And that was a picture to me of what so often, all too often is the case on the part of genuine, sincere, earnest, church-going men and women, boys and girls who attend Sunday school and Bible class, and because they can see, as it, with, as it were, with their mental eye, and can appropriate certain facts with their mind, because they can give the right answer at the given moment to any given question, are still unaware of the fact that they are spiritually blind. In other words, the fact that you know what Easter stands for, the fact that you know what Christmas stands for, the fact that you know and may even believe and give full consent to the fact that Jesus Christ came into this world 1900 years ago and lived a sinless life and died an atoning death and rose in victory from the dead to ascend into the presence and glory of God and lives there forever and is able and willing to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him, that does not in itself mean that you're a Christian. You've been Christianized. You've been tutored in fact. But it doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than the fact that I know that tomorrow morning at ten minutes past seven the plane is going to leave Adelaide and fly to Melbourne and that it's got a comparatively good engine because it was made in England. <laughs> and that all the personnel have been teed up for that. And I give consent to that fact. I believe it. Confirmed it. I've got the ticket. The price has been paid. That doesn't mean to say that at ten minutes past seven I shall be on that plane if I do no more than believe the fact that I've just recited. I've got to do far more than believe. I've got to act on the facts that I believe. I wish I could get there by just believing. I wouldn't have to get up so early. <laughs> but if I want to get there, because of the facts I believe, I've got to act on those facts and step into the place. Now, it may well be that some of you here know all the facts. Some of you boys and girls I see about, you've been brought up by lovely Christian parents. They've taught you from your earliest days the simple facts of salvation. And you know all those facts. And yet if the truth were told, if God somehow could expose your heart, it would be discovered to be entirely empty of God. Because you've never acted personally, deliberately, intelligently upon the things that you have believed. You can't, you can't have faith in a chair standing up. You can believe it's a chair, you can recognize the purpose for which it was made, but you can't have faith in it. Not standing up. You've got to sit on it to have faith in it. And take your feet off the ground. Then you've got faith in the chair. That's what God demands of you. And God demands of me. Not just to stand and gaze with however much veneration, admiration, or even gratitude. Not just to stand and gaze at the cross and believe that he died for but to come to yourself and say, Lord Jesus, I'm one of the sinners you died to save. I'm one of those for whose sins you paid the price. And I want to be numbered right now with those whose names are recorded forever in the Lamb's Book of Life because for them the debt has been paid. It is finished, he cried. A word that is still used today in the Middle East when a, a bill is received. Go into a shop and buy something and ask for a receipt. And instead of putting receipt with that, he'll put, it is finished. That's what the Lord Jesus meant. It is finished. Paid in full. 
No further demand to be entertained on this account. What a wonderful thing that 1900 years ago the, Father, the Lord Jesus looked into the Father's face and he said, Father, when a boy or a girl or a man or a woman on the 10th of April, 1960 in Adelaide, comes to you and claims the efficacy, the adequacy, the sufficiency of my death on their behalf for their sins that they may become forgiven. Father, I want you to reckon on that day when they come to you that it's finished, paid in full. And for that boy, that girl, that man, that woman, there's no further demand to be made. That's what took place at the cross. And the Father from heaven said, Amen. And raised him from the dead. So it's possible to believe without being saved. To believe without being saved. Because belief is not faith. Faith is belief in action. And all too many churches are filled today with unsaved belief. Unsaved belief. Who have been taught believism, but not faith. There's a story given to us in the Bible of an unsaved believer. We read the account in the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel, but I'd like to talk, draw your attention to the same story as recorded by Mark in the 10th chapter. Mark chapter 10. And in the 46th verse it says, And they came to Jericho, and as the Lord Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. I want you to notice in that verse 46, the groupings of people. First of all, there was the Lord Jesus himself. Secondly, there were his disciples. Not very many of them, just a handful. Thirdly, a great number of people. In other words, the crowd. So there was Christ, the disciples and the crowd. That's the setting. Now it doesn't matter where you go, that's always the setting. Christ, his disciples, and the crowd. Usually, under normal circumstances, Christ, just a handful of disciples, maybe only one or two, and a big crowd, who are strangers to Jesus Christ. In a gathering such as this, the, the balance is readjusted and there's the Lord Jesus without a shadow of a doubt. And there are rather more disciples than is customary in such a crowd under any other circumstances, on a football pitch, for instance, or a bus. And far fewer of the crowd than would normally be the case elsewhere. But the grouping remains. For that the Lord Jesus is here with, is, is without a shadow of a doubt. That there are many of his disciples here is without a doubt. And that there are representatives tonight of the crowd. A great multitude of unconverted, unforgiven sinners. That is true without a doubt. But it isn't that grouping which in itself is the most important part of the scene. The scene is this. That within that grouping, there was the immediate express object of Christ's quest. Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. He was the immediate express object of the quest of Jesus Christ. He was the prime reason why the Lord Jesus was passing that way. Bartimaeus didn't know it. Any more than I knew it in the day that I was converted. I didn't know that I, that night, was one of the express objects of Christ's presence and quest at that particular time. I wasn't the only object, as a matter of fact, because when I was in New Zealand, just a week or two back, in Auckland, a gentleman I hadn't seen for many, many years, indeed since the war, came to visit me and he said, remember the boys' camp that we were at together those years ago in 1927? I said, yes, his name is Donald Skate. He said, we were both converted on the same night at precisely the same time. So, I couldn't claim the monopoly of God's attention that evening. 
He had Donald Skegg in mind. He's married and he's got a family of his own now and an active Christian man in New Zealand. Haven't seen him for many years. But the wonderful thing to know is this, that what happened in his heart then is what happened in my heart now with the same consequences. And we can meet thousands of miles away from the spot where it happened and thank God for his mercy. But if there was nobody else that night in that tent who were the immediate object, the express purpose of Christ's presence, we were. And we've lived to tell the story and we know it's true. And on this particular occasion, the express object of Christ was to meet personally a man called Bartimaeus. He was blind, he was poor, and he was a beggar. He was a poor, blind, beggarly believer. But he wasn't saved. Why should we call him a believer? Well, because the context of the story tells us that. When he heard, it says, verse 47, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Half a minute, did you notice what it said? When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, that was his human title. Jesus, the, the street preacher, you know, the man who came from Nazareth. That's what the crowd called him. They didn't recognize him to be the Messiah. They didn't recognize him to be the Christ, God's prophet, priest, and king, anointed to be savior and redeemer. The crowd didn't call him that. No, no, no. The crowd said, he's Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But no sooner did blind Bartimaeus hear that it was Jesus of Nazareth, then he began to cry out and say, not Jesus, thou man from Nazareth, but Jesus, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. And not only did he say, have mercy on me, but the actual tense used in what he said was, have mercy on me now. It was specific. It was imperative. Have mercy on me now. Not tomorrow, not in a week's time, but now. Now, why was it that Bartimaeus recognized Jesus of Nazareth, the street preacher from Nazareth, how did he recognize him as the son of David? Of course, to all Jews, that was the expression used for the one who was to come as Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David. He was not untaught. Somehow, we don't know how, but he was not untaught in the things of God. In the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah. What a wonderful verse for a beggar. Don't know who taught him this. Maybe some disappointed Sunday school teacher. Years before. When Bartimaeus was there as a small boy. Only sticking pins in the chap in front of him. But somehow he got to know all about it. And it was in his mind. He had been tutored in the facts. He had been, if you put it this way, Judaized in the Christianity of the Jews because remember, Judaism was Christianity gone wrong. Judaism was the religion of the Christ. Judaism became heathenism when they missed the Christ himself. As Christianity becomes a heathenism if it is a Christianity without Christ. You don't make Christianity Christianity by calling it Christianity. You can't just think up any kind of philosophy of life and say, we're going to build a church with a star on top and we're going to put a notice outside and say, this is a Christian church. That doesn't make it a Christian church. It's Christ that makes a church a Christian church, not religion. But however he heard it, he was tutored in these facts. Verse 1 of Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money. Good for a beggar. Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in patent. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. 
I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This was the promise of God, that in the son of David, the Messiah, the Christ, there would become, there would come into the world salvation, forgiveness, soul peace. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, verse 6. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon you. And to our God he will abundantly pardon. And Bartimaeus had been taught all this. Isaiah 42. Behold my servant. Whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 3, a bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Verse 7, to open the blind eye, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that's my name. These are the sure mercies of David. I don't know who taught it him. But he knew it all. But all that he had ever known about the son of David and all the bright prospects for those who knew him had left it, had, had left him where it found him in the gutter. Poor, blind, a beggar. How did he come to identify Jesus of Nazareth with? Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, the Christ. Well, he heard many things about the Lord Jesus that matched all that he had been taught in times gone by about what they should expect of the Messiah, the Christ of God, as the, as the passers-by stopped to chatter in the marketplace. The merchants squabbling over their deals. Every now and again they'd burst in with the latest about the street preacher. The indignation of the Jews. And the strange things that he was doing. And yet the wonderful things that he was doing. And he listened. And he put the pieces together until the picture was complete. It may well have been that there came a day when a man sat down by his side in the gutter and said, Bartimaeus, I'll tell you this. I was a beggar like you once. I was as blind as you are. But I'll tell you what happened. Jesus of Nazareth came my way. You know, he's the son of David. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He saves me. I tell you what, I tell you what, Bartimaeus, if ever you got a chance to meet him, that would be the greatest day in your life. Never miss it. And he remembered. But all that he had come to know and all that he had come to believe, however he had come to know it and however he had come to believe it, had left him where it found him in the gutter. A poor, blind, Beggarly believer. But of one thing he was completely convinced, and that was this. Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus, the son of David. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ of God. He came to open blind eyes. He came to set men free, to take them out of the prison house. He came to feed the thirsty. He came to feed the hungry. He came for those who had no money. He came for those who were poor and lost. Of this he became completely convinced. He believed. But he was an unsaved believer. Because somehow the occasion had never occurred upon which he could translate what he believed into faith. This is the impotent, the impotent, the powerlessness of an impersonal belief. I don't know how it is, my unconverted, unsaved, believing friend. I don't know how it is that you have been Christianized, how you have been tutored in the things of God, how it is you know the facts you do know about Jesus Christ. But has it remained with you an impersonal and impotent belief? Has what you know and what you believe about Jesus Christ ever truly transformed your life? Has it given you the inward conviction of God the Holy Spirit to your spirit that you're a child of God? 
Do you have the unspeakable joy of which Peter speaks in the knowledge that your sins are forgiven? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Peace that passeth knowledge. Love that passeth knowledge. Peace that passeth understanding. Are you really experientially today more than conqueror through him that loved you? Have you a message for the world? Could you go out into the street and across the first man you saw looking miserable and say, I've got the message of hope that your faith needs? <laughs> because you know it's true. Well, you say, no, I, I must confess I know all the facts, but to be quite honest, in the presence of God himself, I've never known experientially what it is to have Christ touch my life and transform it and flood it with glory. I can't say, I, I cannot say tonight that I'm autonomous, that I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I can't say that because of what he is to me personally, I'm equal to anything and ready for anything. I can't. I know it all. I believe it all. But it's never become experiential. It's left me where it found me. In the spiritual gutter of my own spiritual destitution and bankruptcy. The poor, blind, beggarly believer. I say, what made the difference? What made him dissatisfied with being a poor, blind, beggarly believer? Not the facts he knew them. It wasn't the facts, it was the presence of Christ himself. The presence of Christ, that's what makes the difference. That's why the Bible speaks about those who simply preach the cold, dead letter of the law that kills. Preaching in anything other than the unction of the Holy Spirit so that people are tutored to facts, but they never come aware of the presence. And there are many boys and girls go in and out of Sunday schools Never to come to Christ, never to be saved, never to be redeemed because they're only treated with that. And they never, never, never become aware of the presence. It's cold and cheer, cheerless and chilling. And just so soon as they can escape, they go <clears throat> vowing never to come back. And yet they know the fact. It was the presence of Christ you remember what it says in Luke's record? Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him, and this is what they told him, Jesus of Nazareth, pass it by. And there was a light even in his sightless eyes. The man about whom I believe, about whom I know everything, but who's never touched my life and never healed me and never saved me. He's here. He's here. This is my hour. And suddenly he became acutely aware of the presence of the living Christ. And suddenly in the very presence of the living Christ, he recognized the sheer bankruptcy of beliefs that don't save. Knowledge that doesn't redeem. Oh, my, 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 my Christian friends, this is the desperate need of the world today. This is the desperate need of our churches today. The presence of the living Christ. That unforgiven men and women, desperate men and women, hungry-hearted men and women, seeking men and women, folk groping in the dark may suddenly become acutely aware that he is there. In all his mighty power to save. This is what's missing. This is what the folk in the office miss when you maybe give your testimony. They listen to your words, but they don't become aware of the presence. Maybe this is why your testimony hasn't cut much ice in the university or cut much ice in your school. Maybe it's why the neighbors aren't particularly impressed. They've listened to all you've had to say. They've learned it all. You've tutored them until they're sick to what you have to tell them, but they've never become aware of the present. It's because maybe you only yourself as a Christian knew the dead Christ. And you never knew the living one. You knew there was a good Friday, but you never realized, not entered into the good of that resurrection Sunday morning. It's only when the Lord Jesus in the power of his resurrection lives out his life through you that you being entirely unconscious and unaware of the fact, he makes himself unmistakably known. And so stop listening to what you have to say. And they become strangely aware of him. This is what brings conviction. Not your language, not your arguments, not your persuasiveness, not your personality. But the presence of the living Christ in the power of the Holy Ghost released through your redeemed humanity. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Christ, clothed with sheer humanity. And Christian friend, that's why he wants your humanity. 
Not because of what you are, but because of what he can be in you. That's why we read. Let me quote it to you. In the second of Corinthians, in chapter 2, 2 Corinthians 2, and verse 14. This should be the hilarious language of every forgiven sinner who knows not only that Christ has died to redeem, but rose again to re-inhabit, occupy, flood and fill with God the humanity of a forgiven sinner. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 2. Thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory and through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. That's normal Christianity. This isn't to be reserved for special weeks and special speakers. Don't please imagine that at the end of this week it's all over. It isn't, my dear friend, it isn't all over unless Christ is all over. I want to tell you this, that if you have Jesus Christ living in your heart as a forgiven sinner, you, you have all that I ever had. You can't have more and you don't need to have less. It isn't all over tonight. This has just been an incident. This week, just an incident in your life and an incident in my life. This is to be normal for all of us, every day of every week until we see him face to face. Just the Lord Jesus being himself. Who are the trophies, the trophies of Christ's victory. That through us he may spread and make evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. I wonder, Christian friend, Christian boy, girl, the folk amongst whom you live, to your own family, become acutely aware of the fact of Christ because you're around. You never said a word, you just passed through the room, and yet they were strangely aware of the presence of Christ. That's what you were redeemed for. That's why the blood of Christ was shed. To make your humanity transparently available to declare what God is. For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, verse 15, which exhales unto God, discernible alike, notice this, discernible alike among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're a sweet fragrance of Christ so that wherever we go we have one of two effects. Verse 16, to those who are perishing, an aroma wafted from death to death, a fatal odor, the smell of doom. To the other, those who are being saved, an aroma from life to life, a vital fragrance, living and fresh. Wherever you go as a Christian, you should have this effect, one way or the other. The acute awareness of the presence of Christ in you will either be a smell of doom to the damned, awakening them, awakening them to the fact that they're dead, that you have what they don't have, and they'll want to know why it is that you have what they don't have. The life of Christ will be there to them, the aroma, the smell of doom. And to the Christian, it'll be fresh and fragrant, deep calling to deep, spirit answering to spirit. And to the exhausted and the tired and the weary and the discouraged, your presence will be an undergirding of their faith, an awakener of hope within their heart. The light of battle will come again into their faith. That's what your life should be as a Christian. That's what the life of Jesus Christ was. 1900 years ago when he clad himself with his own humanity, there was always a division. And today he gives to you and to me the privilege of being that humanity with which he clothes himself again. It was the acute awareness of the presence of Christ that exposed to Bartimaeus the emptiness of his belief, the uselessness of his belief, the futility of his beliefs, the impotence of his beliefs. And by virtue of the presence of the living Christ himself, he was saying in his own heart, I dare not, I cannot, I must not go on living in the gutter when the Christ who can save me is at hand. Why should I have impersonal beliefs that lead me where they find me when faith can take what God provides? And he began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me now. I'm tired of the gutter. I'm tired of being an unbelieving belief. And the impotence of an impersonal belief was turned into the importunity 
of a living faith. And you know what happens? Don't forget the grouping. Christ, disciples, and the crowd. And the crowd had got completely accustomed, completely acclimatized to seeing Bartimaeus sitting in the gutter. Indeed, if he had had a bad cold one day and stayed at home and he wasn't in the gutter, they'd have felt it wrong. They'd have thought, that's funny, I'm sure there was somebody there yesterday. Oh yes, of course, it's old Bartimaeus, he's missing. They would got completely accustomed, accustomed, completely acclimatized to having a beggar on the, on the street and probably a good many besides. And they didn't question his belief. They didn't mind a bit what he believed about Jesus at Nazareth. He could believe what he liked as long as he stuck in the gutter. A sort of waste paper basket said they're on chain. <laughs> it gave them a good feeling inside, you see. They could do a little philo- philanthropy. But if they went to beg it to throw something at, they wouldn't feel so good. And when he began to cry out, that Jesus, the son of David, might have mercy on him then, there and then. It says, verse 48, Mark 10, verse 48, many charged him, many of the crowd, great multitudes. There weren't many disciples, there were only many in the crowd. Many charged him. What do they charge him? Oh, they came along and said, that's right, they patted him on the back and they said, Bartimaeus, that's it, this is the man you need. Is that what they say? Oh, no. Many charged him that he should hold his peace. They told him to keep quiet. They told him to keep his mouth shut. They said, we don't mind what you believe, but don't make a fool of yourself. We don't mind what you believe, but don't, for goodness sake, act as though you mean what you believe. Now, isn't that extraordinary? And yet you'll discover that this is true no matter where you go. In the crowd. And you don't have to be outside a church fellowship to be in the crowd. Lots of the crowd go to church. And they won't mind you singing in the choir. They won't mind you singing, I know that my Redeemer lives, so long as you don't act as though you do. They won't mind a bit. They'll, they'll pat you on the back and shake you by the hand and say, that was beautiful. <laughs> but I say, don't act as though you need a Redeemer and don't act as though you know he lives and as though he had any claims upon you. That would be fanatical. And they get terribly disturbed if you begin to act as though you really believe and mean what you think. They think you've got religion. A bit too bad, you see. You can come to church and nobody minds you singing Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. It makes a beautiful crescendo at the end. You know what crescendo is? It's bashed at the end, though. You go along, you see. (laughs) They don't mind a bit. It makes a good song. But you dare to go home. You dare to go home and tell them that you as a ruined sinner have repented toward God and you've converted toward Christ. you put your trust in him and you've been gloriously saved. They'll throw up their hands in holy heart. We don't mind you singing about a savior who saves ruined sinners, but don't behave as though you're one of the ruined sinners that needs to be saved. Strange, isn't it? You can sit and beg in the gutter as long as you like and believe what you may like to believe, but don't act. Don't act. Don't act intelligently. You can sing about a saviour, but don't let him ever save you. God commands all men everywhere to repent and be converted. Believe in God, but don't obey him. Because if you obey him, you'll get converted. You'll repent. But he cried the more. A great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me now. Oh yes. When an unbelieving sinner who only believes facts but has never turned those beliefs into faith becomes acutely aware of the presence of the living Christ, it takes, thank God, it takes more than the crowd to keep him away from Christ. I didn't get much encouragement. When I got home, my parents went, I'm sad to say, Christians, nor my brothers and sisters, but they couldn't keep me away from Christ. They thought I was quaint. I began to read my Bible. Now, isn't that a terrible thing to do in a Christian country? 
I actually began to read my Bible. Well, they were sincerely worried about my mental condition. A boy of 12 reading his Bible every night by his bedside. There would be whispered committee meetings between others of the family. Do you know what he's doing? He's reading his Bible. Now, I was a good Anglican. I'd been well baptized as a baby. And I was accepted. My family were in high esteem within the church. We always did the refreshments at the bazaar. <laughs> and I actually began to read my Bible. Well, what a terrible calamity to fall over a, a, a respectable home. <laughs> now, that may sound exaggerated, but believe it or not, that was the reaction, and they called me Bible Bill. <laughs> because as a boy of 12 in Christian England, in a respectable church-going family, I had the fanaticism to want to read my Bible every day. <clears throat> but you see, I had become acutely aware of the presence of the living Christ. And every page of my Bible told me about him. I saw him on every page. And it'll take more than the crowd to keep you away from Christ. Once you become acutely aware of his presence, that he's alive and not dead. You see, if Christianity is turned just into entertainment, just a song, salvation will become as static as a stained glass window and as cold and empty of life. And you can see right through it. For its lifelessness. Unsaved believers. There are some of you here tonight, you're poor, blind, beggarly believers. You know it all in your head. You've never once obeyed God stepped out by faith, acted intelligently upon the facts that you know. You're satisfied to be Christianized, religionized, to be called this or called that. That's the tragedy of our day. I was speaking to a man who had just come back from Formosan. He says the most bewildering situation on the mission field today is that Formosans in that particular area don't see why they should become Southern Baptists. They just don't see why they should be Lutherans. And they can't understand why they should be Methodist. There are over 33 different missionary societies operating in Mosa, in Formosa. And the inhabitants are completely bewildered because they all say they're Christian, but this lot want to make them Lutherans, and this lot want to make them Methodists, and they want to make them Southern, fancy a Southern Baptist in Formosa. Well, no, thank God for every wonderful Christian. I've met many of them. It's been my privilege again and again to minister in their fellowships and in their churches. But sinners don't get their sins forgiven by becoming either Methodists or Presbyterians or Anglicans or Southern Baptists or Plymouth Brethren. Sinners get their sins forgiven when they come to Christ and have their sins forgiven. Thank God for every company of God's people who meet under any name they like to choose. But let's keep first things first and realize that it is the presence of the living Christ himself who bears still the hallmarks of his saviorhood, the wounds in his hands and feet, the marks of his death, and the crown of his victory when he rose again from the dead. He cried so much the more, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me now. And Jesus stood still. <clears throat> and commanded him to be called. Of course he did, because he was the specific object of his quest. That's precisely why Jesus Christ was there at that particular time on that particular street. And that is just why the Lord Jesus Christ is here tonight, because there's a boy, a girl, a man, a woman here tonight, and you are here by divine appointment. And the Lord Jesus is here precisely and specifically for you. That's why you're here. He stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise. He called it thee, of all people, of all the crowd here, thee. Who passed on the message? The crowd? Oh no, the many charged him to shut his mouth and keep quiet, not to make a fool of himself. 
They told him to stay in the gutter where his beliefs had found him and left him. This was the language of discipleship. This is the language of discipleship. Arise. Be of good comfort. He personally calleth thee. Personal. Just between you and him. That's the language of discipleship. Did you ever hear the language of a disciple? Oh, I grant you that many of us are pretty clumsy. I grant you that we blurt out the wrong things at the wrong time all too often. I grant you. But I say, you don't often meet disciples. You're always rubbing shoulders with the crowd. You don't often meet disciples. You don't know how much courage that it took them to, to muster before they blurted out the wrong thing at the wrong time. Will you believe they meant it with all their heart for your good? Will you believe that clumsy as they may have been at that time, they were trying to be disciples? To pass on to you the good news that somebody loves you, that somebody's right there for you in all the power and saving energy of his resurrection? That he's got something to say to you personally, from himself personally. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. He listened and he obeyed the voice of a disciple. And he threw off his beggar's rags. He threw away his garment, patched and torn, the hallmarks of his poverty. Listen. The only rags he ever had in his back were second hand. He was a beggar. The only coin he ever put in his pocket was second hand. He was a beggar. The only crust he ever stuck in his mouth was second hand. He was a beggar. And I want to tell you this, all you may know and all you may believe and all you may sing about Jesus Christ if you've never heard his voice and come to him and thrown away your beggar's rags. All you know and all you believe and all you ever sang is second hand. You're a poor, blind, beggarly believer. But as best I know how tonight, I want to be to you a disciple. I want to bring you his message personally to you. Be of good comfort. He calleth thee. And be as wise as Bartimaeus. And Jesus answered and said, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Strange question to ask. He must have known. Yes, but you see, from the impotence of an impersonal belief to the importunity of a saving, living faith, the Lord Jesus wanted to steer him past the dangers of impressionable emotions. He wanted the man to know the implications of what he was doing. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus, I want you to pause and think. I want you to understand the intelligent implications of what you're doing. You're coming to me, and don't you see, if you come to me, I'll heal you. I'll save you. I'll touch you. I'll make you a new man. And maybe that isn't what you want. Maybe all you're coming for me for, to me for is a little bit of sympathy. You don't want to be anything more or better than what you are, a beggar. Maybe you don't quite understand. Don't you see, Bartimaeus, if you come to me and I touch your sight and I give you eyes that can see, you can never be a beggar again. You can't sit there in the gutter and get people to throw coins at you or crusts of food they can't eat themselves. Don't you see, Bartimaeus, if you come to me, you're going to be a, a completely new creature. You're going to be a completely new man. You're going to have entirely new responsibilities. You have to work. Maybe I, maybe you didn't understand. Maybe all you've come for me for is, is just a little bit of, little bit of, a little bit of sympathy and maybe a nice soft cushion so that you can sit down more comfortably in bed. You know, lots of people get religion for that. They don't want the implications of discipleship. They don't want to live the kind of life where Jesus Christ has totalitarian jurisdiction. They don't want the kind of salvation where Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, occupies your humanity, wears you like a suit of clothes, so that your hands are his hands, your lips his lips, your feet your feet, so that the money you have in your pocket is his to spend. The time that you have to spare is his to use. Oh no, you say, I don't want a salvation like that. I, I still want to be a beggar. I, I don't want any of the implications of discipleship. I, I don't want any new jobs or new responsibilities, but I do want to sock to my bad conscience. I'm sorry, that isn't in the book. That's not in this book. 
There is a message that calls itself a gospel, but it's not in this book. That will sop your conscience and excuse your conduct, but it's not in this book. This book is a book that invites you to come to Jesus Christ first to know that your sins are forgiven through his atoning death and then to present your body to be re-inhabited by the risen Christ in the power of his resurrection so that he may expend you for God and for man for eternity. As when and where he will. You can never be the same again. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. All the beggar's rags have gone. Behold, everything has become new. And said the Lord Jesus to Bartimaeus, Are you quite sure that this is what you want? And the blind man said to him, Lord, Lord, that's the word, Lord, what you say goes, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Only give me eyes that can see and your Lord to tell me what to do as, when and where you want it done. That's conversion. That's genuine salvation. That's when a man really gets somewhere with God. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Thy faith, said Jesus, has done what your beliefs never did. Your beliefs left you in the gutter. But the faith that said, have mercy on me now, has saved you. And immediately he received his sight and followed him and glorified God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. They rubbed their eyes. And the object of pity suddenly became a source of wonder. Past the peril of impressionable emotions into the pathway of impassioned allegiance. Redeemed! Saved, remade, recommissioned to a life that he had long since despaired of. This is God's work. This is Easter. What's Easter going to mean to you? Is it going to mean this? Richard Weaver, drunken, fighting brawler, dragged his mother by her hair round and round the kitchen floor because she dared to pray for him. Any hope for a man like that? Humanly speaking, none. Or drunken son. An alcoholic. With nothing but his animal passion to advertise he lost his faith. There came a day when Richard Weaver became acutely aware of the presence of a living Christ. He'd known it all from his mother's lips since his earliest childhood. He'd known it all. He'd been Christianized from the start. But his beliefs had left him for years a beast. But that day that he became acutely aware of the presence of the risen Lord and said, have mercy on me now, the miracle took place. He became a new creature. He went up and down the mining fields of Yorkshire and he proclaimed the emancipating, unsearchable riches of Christ. Big, tough, blasphemous men would fall to their knees in tears of repentance and be raised from the dead. And the object of pity that could pull his mother by her hair around the floor became a source of wonder. An unsaved believer became a regenerate spirit whose humanity, cleansed in the blood of Christ, blazed with the glory of the risen Lord. Tonight, boy, girl, man, woman, poor, blind, beggarly believer, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I want to bring you his message to you personally. Be of good comfort. Arise. He calleth thee.
now. You want him? Then why not come? As Bartimaeus did, with nothing but your pocket, to receive his wealth. And I'm going to suggest tonight, without any outward display, I somehow don't think that it's called for now. In a few seconds, we're going to pause and pray. But I want to give you a deliberate opportunity to put your trust in Christ without embarrassing you in any sense, without confusing the issue. The issue is, will you come to Christ? Will you take what grace provides? That's the issue. That's the only issue. So I'm going to ask Christian friends here, and there are many, many, many disciples tonight, very few of the crowd, many disciples. I'm going to ask them to help me to help you. And as I lead you in prayer, sentence by sentence, Christian folk are going to pray after me in the same words, just sentence by sentence. And if you've never come to Jesus, you've never come to Christ, you've never acted upon what you've known for years, I'm going to ask you deliberately right here and now to mingle your voice with ours and speak to Jesus Christ as though nobody here but you and he. Get it out of your mind that you have to attend an after meeting or walk to the front or put your hand up or do anything else to get saved. You don't. That's a helpful thing sometimes. But the way you get saved is when you come to Jesus Christ. Personally, in your heart. When a man believes in his heart, he believes in the salvation. Later, your mouth will confess to the fact. You won't be able to prevent it. So right now, say to the Lord Jesus, Thou Son of David, God's Christ, my Savior, have mercy on me. Not someday, but now and go home and rejoice. Never to be the same again. To glorify God and to leave the crowd staggered, amazed, wondering, baffled at the grace of God. Now let's bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to pray sentence by sentence. The simplest language possible. A language that I used in so many words as a boy and found life in Christ. Christian folk in the same simple words will pray immediately after me, sentence by sentence. And as no, nobody will hear but you and Christ himself, will you add your voice to ours and speak to him, receive him, trust him, now, once and for all and forever, to go out of this place redeemed, saved and knowing. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I am a guilty sinner. And sin cuts me off from God. Because of sin, I was born spiritually dead. But thou didst die for me. Thy precious blood was shed to cleanse my heart from sin. And I thank thee now for thy invitation to me. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. Because thou hast promised, I know I am received and eternally redeemed. I know that thou wilt never leave me, as thou dost dwell within me, by thy Holy Spirit. Teach me what I don't know. Lead me into paths of righteousness. Display thy glory through my humanity to the blessing of my fellow men. 
my family, my neighbors, my country. If needs be for the world, I am glad to be expendable for God. And for thy name's sake. Amen. Amen. And Lord Jesus, thou gracious, loving Lord, present now in our midst, we thank thee for those known only to thee, <clears throat> for whom thou didst come tonight. The express objects of thy gracious quest, who having heard thy voice, have come to thee. Bless them beyond their asking. Flood their souls with untold blessing and joy. Witness by thy Holy Spirit to their spirit in such a way that no doubt can ever array, uh, remain upon any horizon of their life that they have become children of God. Saved forever. Born of thy spirit. Numbered amongst the redeemed. Written in heaven and heaven bound, and heaven on the way to heaven. For thy name's sake. Amen. <clears throat> I need only say to you this, that if that was the language of your heart, in Christ's name I have the right to say to you, your sins are forgiven. Because he's able and he's willing. He's as good and as great as his name. He says, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If you come, you receive. Thank him for it. Go home and rejoice. Get down by your bedside and say, Lord Jesus, for the first time, I can look you in the face and say, my Savior. And when you arise in the morning, thank him again. And remember that your body tomorrow will be at his disposal for him to live his resurrection life in you and through you. To the amazement of the crowd. And they will glorify God because of you. Our closing hymn, a very lovely one, 641, omitting the chorus. Not the chorus, just the words. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee. Notice, this isn't just a hope, it's a categorical statement of fact. Sing it tonight as you've never sung it before, knowing it's true. Trusting thee for full salvation, great and free. For thy grace and tender mercy, trusting now. 641.